Bill, were you involved in the plan to to help the Chiefs win? Yeah, I, I can't talk about it though, Tim. Obviously. Oh, okay. <laughs> it was a secret meeting. Was Bill Burns there or Lloyd Austin? Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't. Again, I really don't want to get too much. <laughs> you know, Pete Bill and Lloyd's private, uh, you know, meetings over the last week. So. Hey there, welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Tim Miller here with Bill Crystal. A.B. Stoddard will be joining us shortly. Bill, are you excited for this? I very much era? so. Very much so. Uh, me too. Me and Bill have been doing a YouTube show called Ballot Box every Tuesday. I am a sicko, but not so much of a sicko that I'm going to do a daily podcast and a YouTube show with Bill Crystal. So he's going to be coming here on Mondays, many Mondays, uh, where we're going to reconstitute that. Uh, you know, we mostly... I made jokes, he told Dan Quayle stories, and we did some politics analyst analysis, right? Tim Tim told Jeb Bush stories, John Huntsman stories. I don't know. We, we could go down a couple of roads here that would be not great for either okay. of us. Uh, okay, all right. Well, then let's just move on. We've got a lot here. Uh, there was the successful deep state operation in Las Vegas. I want to wait for AB to get to that. Um, Israel forces rescued two hostages in Rafa. Uh, we had the RFK Jr. big ad, fake outrage over the Black National Anthem, border infighting at the Biden White House. You had a very provocative opening newsletter that has some fe- ru- feathers ruffled. Uh, but I just I want to start with you with the most important thing, which is Donald Trump and his Russophilia. So let's listen for people who haven't heard it to Donald Trump talking about his plans for NATO. They asked me that question. One of the presidents of a big country stood up, and said, well, sir, uh, if we don't sir. pay and we're attacked by Russia, will you protect us? I said, you didn't pay? You're delinquent? He said, yes, let's say that happened. No, I would not protect you. In fact, I would encourage them to do whatever the hell they want. You got to pay. You got to pay your bills. He'd encourage Russia to do whatever the hell they want. William, thoughts about that? I mean, so much to say about it. It's so revealing. And I mean, on, on a less important scale, it's a fake. St- can we just stipulate that this did not happen? The president yes. of a big country did not say, sir, <laughs> what would happen if, if, if we didn't pay our bills? Whatever that means. And, and Russia invaded us. So he's, of course, it's his usual ludicrous invention. Secondly, this is also not the most important thing, but the fact that the crowd seems to erupt into applause, at least on that audio clip we just played, does not reassure me about the health of at least Trump, the Trump supporters among the Republican Party. But it is, I mean, it's just mind-bogglingly irresponsible and dangerous, and many, many people have commented on it. My only additional comment would be, it's not new. I mean, that is, it's good to call attention to these things when Trump gives us an opportunity to do so, honestly. And if, if from my point of view, if a few percent more Americans realize, geez, we can't afford a second term with that guy, that's great. So I'm not begrudging anyone commenting on this and and, and pointing out uh, you know, either at length or briefly, how incredibly dangerous this is. And then there's something a little funny about some of the comments. It's like, wow, we just discovered that Trump would really be a wildly irresponsible foreign policy president who's pro-Putin and won't support our allies. So, I mean, I do think there is the new context, and it's not new because the war's been going on for two years, but in his first term, right, the, the Putin, there was the possibility of Putin aggression, right? But right now, you know, we are seeing the reality of it. Right. and And certainly it's much more believable uh you know you could imagine that putin you know if trump got in there would try to move it in current again into nato territory and so in that sense this is making it a little more real yeah, very very much it's a very good point very a fair point i mean it's one of several reasons why a second trump term would be so much more dangerous than the first trump term was um i want to our friend marco rubio your i think you i think you endorsed him in 2016 i can't quite remember I but so um I want, sequentially i can't even remember 2016 i think i might have voted from here in virginia that jeb was out at that point or no jeb was, still there. <laughs> jeb was out by virginia yeah. we we uh uh withdrew responsibly after the south carolina primary yeah. and and endorsed the person most likely to win uh Lion Ted Cruz. So I didn't exactly cover myself in glory. Okay. Your boy, Marco. I, I, there was one element of his reaction that I think is just worth chewing over. Um, let's listen to him with Jake Tapper over the weekend. Donald Trump is not a member of the Council of Foreign Relations. He doesn't mm. talk like a traditional politician. And uh, we've already been through this now. You'd think people had figured it out by now. What he's basically saying is, if you, if you see the comments, he said NATO was broke or busted until he took over because people weren't paying their dues. And then he told the story about how he used leverage to get people to step up to the plate 
and, and become more active in NATO. He's not the first American president. In fact, virtually every American president at some point in some way has complained about other countries in NATO not doing enough. Um, you know, Trump's just the first one to express it in these terms. But I, hmm. I'm zero concerned because he's been president before. I know exactly what he has d done and will do uh, with the NATO alliance. But there has to be an alliance. It's not America's defense with a, a bunch of small junior partners. Some of these are big countries with big economies. Many of them are doing more. The Germans mm -hmm. are doing a lot. Uh, um, yeah, he's just the only one to express it in these terms, Bill. You know, he's like other people have criticized NATO before. And, you know, Donald Trump's kind of criticizing NATO, just not in the traditional diplomatic words. He's just kind of saying that Russia could invade a NATO country. And if they don't pay up, then what? Then tough titties. Right. And Marco, at the end, sort of his little bit of the remains of actual concern about real foreign policy in the real world kicks in. And he says, yeah, actually, the Europeans are doing kind of more than we expected. And some right. of them have stepped up. Germany's actually doing better than we thought, it, which, of course, totally undercuts and vitiates the, the whole idea that Trump should be saying this now. But I mean, it gets back to just your point earlier, which I, it's really worth just emphasizing. It's, it's one thing to be irresponsible speculatively in a world of peace. Uh, right. And, or a sure. world of semi peace where Putin has invaded, but it's subsided, so to speak. Uh, it's another thing to be irresponsible now, two years into the uh, uh, two years after the attack on Ukraine and two years into the war in Ukraine with things really in the balance and there and, of course, in Europe in general and in the world in general. And for him to be so there is a level of irresponsibility that Trump's exhibiting, but there's a level of irresponsibility to be defending Trump now. And it's, yes. just, it's not true of everyone else. I mean, some people, some of these members of Congress, 17 senators voted to advance the Ukraine. Uh, Israel, Taiwan, national security bill, 17 Republican senators, even though they sort of would have preferred, you know, to have the border thing. And they sort of said that we need the border thing. But, you know, at the end of the day, Mitch McConnell and some of these people said, OK, this is really a serious moment. We can't continue to mess around. There are members of the House. Mike Turner, who was in Kiev last week, says we're, we're going to work around Speaker Johnson if we have to with a, possibly with a discharge petition. So some Republicans, I don't want to overpraise them because they've been sure. horribly irresponsible in so many ways, but, you know, are sort of being a little more responsible now, but not not Marco. Um, no, who voted against like, advancing the bill. I mean, yeah. this, he was a Mr. International Responsibility back in 2014, 2015, 2016, right? Yeah. I mean, even uh, Rand Paul said this was stupid. I mean, when, when Rand Paul is acting more responsible than you and your talking points, that should be concerning about foreign policy. I, like the thing that really grinds my gears about this, which is why I wanted to play it, is this talking point. And like the, the term gaslighting annoys me, but there's no nothing that is more clearly gaslighting than this. Like you think people would have figured out by now that Trump just has a little bit of rough talk, you know, but that he's actually responsible, that he actually is, is a good president. But it's just, you know, sometimes he just, you know, does a little Queens banter. And it's like, what like what are you talking about, Marco? Like the the assault on the Capitol was a direct result of Trump's irresponsible rhetoric. Right. Like this notion that, oh, I like that they're still trying to get away with this notion that that you should take him seriously, but not literally like in 2024. It's just really fucking maddening. It is. It is maddening. And tomorrow is the third anniversary of the vote in the Senate not to convict Trump after he'd been impeached. Uh. And one of I think seven Republican senators did the right thing. And Marco Rubio was one of those who followed and Mitch McConnell and and said, no, 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 you know, well, the system will take care of this over the next three years. Brutal. OK, I want to bring in A.B. Last thing, though, you, you have more conversations than I do with folks in Europe, you know, that are kind of part of this alliance. What is your uh, like as far as the level of alarm is concerned, uh, uh, you know, anything to add on kind of the view from our friends in Europe at this point? No, it's a close, getting close to 10, 10 out of 10 and uh, whatever the right way to say that is 10 on the alarm right. scale. And I think for the reason you said, I mean, it's one thing to be sort of speculatively, you know, jawbone Europe to get them to spend more again when we're sort of at peace. And, and uh, but now to say this in the in the with the Republic, with the fight going on in Congress about uh, continuing our support for Ukraine and uh, with the situation they face, I think they, they are just really coming to grips with what a Trump, how, how very, very dangerous a Trump second term would be. So they're, you know, they're, they're very alarmed. I mean, they, they always get a little nervous. You know, they're way, they're way beyond nervous. Now, now they're, you know, true alarm. A.B. Stoddard, can we see what you got on there? Uh, is that, uh, when did you, when did you put that together? That's for people that are listening. That is a red sweater with, it looks like some construction paper, yellow number 87 on there. Yeah. Talk so I got that. inspired. Um, and to do a DIY, I don't have any chief's gear around my house. 
So I'm not a Chiefs fan. I don't follow football. But I decided to don some celebratory deep state globalist garb in honor of Travis Kelsey and Taylor. And she was covered in 87s. People found them on her boots, on her neck, on her like nail, you know, the whole thing. So anyway, I don't know. I just like woke up and freaked out and decided I had to just, you know, just I'm really enjoying the fact that they all had to root with Nancy Pelosi for a San Francisco team in Magaland. And they just... They had a rough night. So there's a lot of darkness that we need to get to. So this was my way of like brightening my Monday. Yeah, I have a little bit more shot in Freud. I have a little bit more shot for Freud. I have one note. I have one note. I do. I, we, we could have had the Pfizer Band-Aid from your yeah. vaccine. That's what we could have added that. That would have been my one note to the DIY costume. But it's very, very good. Just in case you redo it for Halloween. Okay. Uh, Jason, if we could play... Um, on the other side of the Sean Freud, Freud scale, I, I'll just, we can all admit this is ridiculous. It's absurd that there is, that uh, our country has devolved to a place where we have a culture war picking sides on the Super Bowl based on a country music singer and a guy that just did an ad for vaccines. But we are in this place. And so for people who don't know, one of my nemeses is a guy named Clay Travis. Uh, he went to college with me. He is a uh, right-wing sports talk radio head. That's a thing now. Uh, he has a sports talk radio show that is combined with MAGA outrage of the day talking points. I wrote a very lovely profile from a while back, if you want, if you want to find it. It was one of my most enjoyable things to write. And I want to hear, here was Clay Travis on Fox over the weekend with Howard Kurtz discussing who he was rooting for. You weighed in on the tail of mania a few weeks ago when you said she was partially responsible for the Kansas City Chiefs losing a couple of games. Do you stand by that comment? I hope that she's the Yoko Ono of the Kansas City Chiefs and she destroys their dynasty and mm -hmm. puts them down in flames. That's why I am proudly supporting the San Francisco 49ers, America's team, on Sunday against All Kansas right. City, Patrick Mahomes, Taylor Swift, you, and Travis Kelsey. You got Go that, you got Niners. All right. Sports expert Clay Travis with <laughs> totally <laughs> with Howard Kurtz, whatever happened to, to whatever shred of integrity was left uh, hosting him. Tough break. Uh, Clay also put a big bet on the 49ers. So uh, that is a shame. On the other hand, we saw Joe Biden, the team a little bit kind of responsive there after the Super Bowl win. Biden with the what are the eyes? The the, the dark, the dark Brandon. Brandon eyes. Thank you. The dark Brandon eyes saying it was all part of the plan. Bill, were you involved in the plan to to help the Chiefs win? Yeah, I, I can't talk about it though, Tim. Obviously. Oh, okay. <laughs> it was a secret meeting. Was Bill Burns there or Lloyd Austin? Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't. I, again, I really don't want to get too much. <laughs> you know, what? Bill and Lloyd's private, uh, you know, meetings over the last week. So. Uh. Um, it's pretty good, though. I mean, it is. It's it's pretty enjoyable. That I think that bringing some levity to this, you know, there's a lot of very seriousness about the um, just the way that the right and the right kind of media echo chamber has just evolved um, from a place of kind of light conspiracy and you know uh, uh, into just total total madness and insanity. And I think that there's some very negative downstream effects from that. But if you're always are taking it seriously, you know, and fact checking them, you know, I, I don't I, I think that there's a limit to how much that works as compared to just mocking. I think that there's a time for mocking. And Biden is not usually that's not usually his cup of tea. You know, he is a soul of the nation reformer, but a little just a little hint of mocking that that's useful. Right, A.B.? Yeah, I think Biden has to do Apparently he's doing TikTok. Um, he, he's last night and he has to do, yeah, he has to do something to make people laugh. He needs to enliven his coalition. He needs to energize people. Um, they're really down and really worried. And so I hope the TikTok videos are a success and I like the dark Brandon memes on, on, from Harris Biden or Biden Harris HQ or whatever they do on Twitter. It's, they actually do funny stuff. Um, and it doesn't matter that Joe Biden has no idea that it's going on. I think that they, they have <laughs> it's some been better. People it's an upgrade. That are you know that are like share, they're they're creating shareable content, and the that's a good thing. The dark well, brand I, of me. I, I agree. But getting back to your close friend Clay Travis, there, Tim. What's with the 49ers being America's team? <laughs> it's really fun. It's not. It is. It does show something. Not to get too serious. 
about the way the conspiracy theorizing leads them. They could just say, we hate the cheese because of Taylor Swift and all this stuff and right. Pfizer and Kel and therefore I'm rooting for the 49ers. But you can't say that anyway. You can't just be lesser of two evils, right? Because you're in an insane conspiratorial world of Satan, good and evil, Satan and and, and God, whatever. Right. And so you've got the, where the, how long ago was it that the 49ers had a quarterback who, <laughs> you know, destroyed America's patriotism forever by taking a knee on the football field. Mm, yes. And, yeah. you know, San Francisco with the gays, the sodomites <laughs> yeah. are in San Francisco. There's that to consider. Nancy Pelosi is there. It, it wasn't a natural fit for America's team, I don't think. But, um, you know, uh, it, I, I don't think that you can't go to a place of logic here. You can't, right. you can't go to a place of logic. Anyway, it's just it was a win for me. It brought AB some joy. I'm uh, gambling is legal here in the free state of Louisiana, so I might have put a little cash on the Chiefs. So I think things are good. I'm happy about it. The, there was a little, a lightly concerning moment during the game for me, which was uh, the RFK Jr. ad. Did you get to see it? Yeah, yeah. It um, it was pretty good. I thought. Like I, I received several texts about it being good. Now there have been some fallout. Uh, how <laughs> RFK's family members did not like it, and he's like apologizing to them on Twitter, saying it was my super PAC that did it. I had nothing to do with it. Meanwhile, the ad is the pinned tweet on his feed, so uh, he's kind of struggling to manage the social media side of this. But just the content of the ad for people that are not, you know, kind of in the Twitter politics bubble. Um, I, he's not a natural fit for this role of of I'm I'm a fresh alternative to these two old guys, but he might be enough of a fit to create problems. What, what was your guys' reaction to it? I, I mean, I, yeah, I agree that it was. I, I think it was. Who knows? I mean, who knows? Really make this really make a difference? But it was effective in its way. It is funny. He's what is RFK Jr. Sixty nine or seventy? I think right? seventy. And that ad was run in nineteen sixty, or the true the original version of the ad. Sure. that they pretty much stole in 1960 when JFK was running and it, it's sort of a famous ad if you're into that kind of, you know, political consultant and ad makers, you know, sort of stuff. And JFK was 43. I don't know. It part of, makes me, makes me wonder, you know, yeah. <laughs> can be nice? <laughs> so now it's RFK is the 70 year old really? young insurgent <laughs> against the 77 year old and an 81 year old. What is going on? <laughs> yeah, that is concerning. I don't know. Uh, AB? I I just um, I just find the whole thing so frustrating. It was uh, a big price tag. He has you know he has deep pockets, with good funding um, coming. We know we, you know we have our theories as to why um, that they're mostly coming from the right, uh, and be people believe he's going to take votes from Biden. He's only on one ballot, I believe Utah, right. uh, and the DNC is tr you know trying to sue him for collusion with his super PAC. He I think he lied, you know, in that tweet to his family saying that he knows nothing about the ads, why it's a pinned tweet. He's a bad guy. And, yeah. I, and, and I, I think that if you are, I mean, I think he's very shrewd as is Trump to always speak to the politically uninformed because those are the people that see that ad and think that's so cool. He's a Kennedy and sing the jingle and, I think he, you know, he looks younger than 70 and he's like into his biceps and whatever. So his push-ups, if we can just say like, the shirtless push-ups were not that impressive. Uh, I, I mean, know, he could have gone a little lower, I think. But. I'm just, I see why people see, like he's novel. This is a cool idea. They believe that a third party can win because they don't actually focus on the details of this. And so I could get really worried, but until he's really has good ballot access, I'm going to try not to, but he's, He's a bad guy. It's just all around. He's a conspiracy theorist and, and he's really in, I mean, it's really takes a lot to have your whole family turn against you publicly. Kennedys are not Kennedys. Right. Um, so it's just, uh, I don't know. I, I, um, I do think it was a good ad and I see why it can be effective, but I'm going to not flip out at this point. Yeah, him and Paul Ghost are in good company there. Uh, um, the, the thing, the ballot access is is obviously going to be the thing to really monitor this year. I was, I've flipped on this it's just in the interest of candor. Some people might have maybe been listening to me six months ago thinking, and uh, where I was saying RFK Jr. being in was maybe good for Biden, um, you know, because of the Trumpy nature of his positions on vaccines and maybe some of the horseshoe type, you know, Joe Rogan bros who who would vote for Trump in a in a 
head to head would would vote for RFK in a three way. And I think that's true. There's going to be some of those types. But, you know, the more you look at the numbers, um, particularly with black voters, you know, I mean, if RFK could cut into Biden's margins, even by 10 percent with black men, 15, you know, and draw 10, 15, get up in the teens, that becomes a real, real problem. And so I've I've basically flipped on my political assessment of this. I want there, there was one other thing that I, I went to a dark place last night. I want to do a little just par, political parlor games after watching the ad. I don't know why this thought popped into my head, but it did. And I thought if it came down, if we were on the bad earth three and it came down to RFK Jr. versus Trump, <laughs> would I find myself supporting RFK Jr.? And I came down on, I guess I, I guess I would have to. And I was, I've, I found myself morbidly curious where you guys would land on that question. Yeah, I haven't Suicide. gone quite to that dark place yet, but um, Suicide I, is also I, an option. I'm happy to go to that dark place with you for at least a, a minute. I guess I'd be with you in this sense. I think an RFK Junior presidency. I, that word, even saying that kind of is not happy. It's not a happy place. But anyway, um, an RFK Junior presidency would be more like a Trump first term than a second term, right? I mean, you wouldn't know. You know, you wouldn't have a cadre of uh, committed authoritarians and right. so forth, America firsters with him. He, on foreign policy, I don't think he actually he's where Trump is for whatever that's worth. I don't know what his views on anything are worth, but I mean, for whatever that's worth. So that it wouldn't be right away destroying NATO. It might, you know. So, I, yes, I agree with you. AB doesn't even want to go there. I'm, I'm watching. AB's AB just, here. AB just She's staring just, AB us is down. Just like, She's like, oh, I hey, I think I, you said AB, AB, AB is sort of. We started wait, off in the happy discussion well, about number eighty seven and the Chiefs, and now don't... why are we doing this, Tim? You, know? you refuse to accept. I'm putting you on the spot right now. RFK oh, Jr. Want... or Trump? The t- gun no, is to your head, no. AB. Definitely RFK Jr. Okay. I agree with. Uh, I, I agree with this that he would sort of bumble through the first couple of years and not be as dangerous. But I, I thought you were throwing this to Bill so he could weigh in. I just told you guys I'm non-dealing with RFK Jr. <laughs> until he's on more ballots. Like there, you know what I mean? There, there's there's another third party effort that's on 14 ballots. So I'm going to like just not get. I'm not going to lose sleep over him yet because I have a lot to lose sleep over. Um, from last week. So I thought you were going to move on. No, I was not going to move on. I didn't on. know you were coming back. To I was me. not like, moving on. I've, I'm putting you I've on the spot. I've written RFK Jr. off. I, I, want, I want the clip for future usage of everyone on this yeah, podcast I'm affirmatively the supporting RFK Jr. Who once no tweeted question. a Bulwark article. I forget what it was. So you never know. You know, strange bedfellows. Um, as you say, okay, there was one other Super Bowl thing. I, I have to get on to Mike Gallagher. But before I do so, I just... Several people on the right, and I just can't take this anymore, were tweeting about how offended they were about the Black National Anthem. My friend Matt Gates said that he would not watch the Super Bowl because of this. Megan Kelly uh, sent a mean tweet about it. The song they're referring to is Lift Every Voice and Sing, which is the most beautiful song. It is positive. It is uplifting. It is like we sing lots of songs before the games. There's no rules about any of this. And it's just like the fact that this... Uh, is a way for them to get angry engagement takes me to a really sad place and pisses me off. And so I want to move on to Mike Gallagher. But before we moved off the parade of Super Bowl articles, I had to just wag my finger at Matt Gates and Megan Kelly and say, very bad on you. Uh, Mike Gallagher, stepping aside, 39 years old. How old is he? 39. He should be running for president, probably. Uh, in a sane world, it'd be a Gallagher Haley primary, and they would be running for president against, you know, Josh Shapiro and Gretchen Whitmer, and we'd have this very vibrant two sided debate, but that's not the world we're in. Instead, Mike Gallagher is retiring. A very, not us- not, it's not normal to retire from Congress at 39 when you have been given the keys to a committee in the China Oversight Committee that uh, he always wanted that he wanted to run, that he asked for, it was an issue that he's, that he's passionate about, that, that seemed to run fairly competently. I mean, I had some, occasionally there, there was some absurdities that would pop up in the, in the China committee. And, you know, Mike Gallagher, I have my issues with, but like, you know, it wasn't like the Jim Comer committee, you know, there, there were at least some normal people that were testifying. Um, he responded to media requests. Uh, there was some basic governance that was happening there. And despite having all that, he wants to, I don't know, what, like be on the board of Raytheon or something. So what, what, where, AB, where are you on this? I uh, don't know if he decided he made this decision to leave before he voted against, we became one of the three to vote against the Mayorkas impeachment last week. 
which he knew he was going to take heat for, and he was threatened afterwards and attacked from the wacky right uh, in Wisconsin. But he, there, what you say is true. He was on a rocket to the moon in a former party, right? He was the dream Republican. He has $4 million in his house account, in his campaign coffers, more than any other House member. He, he was on armed services, intelligence, he's a combat veteran. He's a handsome 39-year-old led the China committee. This was a guy that was going to be the best Republicans could hope for, for president one day in, in, in a party that no longer exists. I mean, no, he did not want to leave after four terms. Um, and again, I don't know if he just made his decision or made it, you know, I think a lot of members, even who haven't, you know, who, who are announcing now have probably made their decision a while ago. Um, this, this Congress has really shown them what it's going to be like going forward. And a lot of them are really miserable about it. And that's why you see like Kathy McMorris Rogers leaving a good chairmanship, Mike Gallagher leaving. So it's not that he responded to an immediate threat, but it is illustrative of what's happening to the party. And it's, it's, it's just, tragic. I mean, that's exactly the kind, whether you agree with him or not, it's exactly the kind of person that we want as our public servant. And, and it's, um, it's, it's so scary to think of what this is going to do in terms of the makeup of the House Republican Conference going forward. And then what the makeup of the House Republican Conference does to the, to the House as a whole. I mean, you can't just, yeah. right, you can't just have a sane conference. You have to have sane elements in both conferences. And, and so that's, that's just when you think out to next year um, and going forward, who is going to be running the House on the Republican side or even in the minority on the Republican side, it's, it's, it's really quite frightening. Bill, you've and been on this for a while. <clears throat> There's like an Adam Smith. There's a supply and demand thing that is happening. Like, and it is, it is in, at the candidate level and at the voter level right? As far as who is opting in and who voters want. And uh, so we have this trio of opt-outs. You mentioned McMorris Roger. It's also worth, worth mentioning Patrick McHenry and Mike Gallagher. None of these people are profiles in courage. It's just like, I'm not praising any of them. Uh, all of them uh, were accommodationists is like the nicest thing that you could say about them during this, the Trump decade that we've uh, been living through. But you know, reasonably rational people that if you were of the view that like this goes away, right, that at some time the Trump era goes away and he disappears or we get the hamburger from heaven and then things move back to normal. These would be the kinds of people that you would that if you're of that view that you would want to have around because they would stabilize things. So they're leaving. And Bill, you've always talked about how the people that would be opting in types of people that call you for your like wise, wise, sage advice, you know, former military guys, conservative, you know, people that might want to go home to where they grew up and run for Congress uh, and, and, you know, might have conservative uh, uh, sensibilities. I, they don't want to run. I, they don't want to have to run in a primary right now in the Republican party. So like on both sides of this, like there's just a vacuum that's being created for the the most crazy, most sociopathic, most narcissistic people imaginable, and that is just a downstream effect of Trump that I think that hasn't really sunken in with a lot of folks. Yeah, totally. And I, I mean, I, so just two points. I, I, uh, Ab's praise of Gallagher is true in the sense that he's very impressive. I've known him for 15 years since so he came as a staffer. I helped him some in 2016 when. Republican uh, representative from his district in Wisconsin suddenly retired and Mike, should I, should he run or not? I said, yeah, take a shot. And um, I thought at that point, Trump might be some would lose in 2016 and there'd be Mike Gallagher in Congress. That would be great. He has been, he really hasn't, he's not just been not a profile in courage. He's been a conspicuous non-profile in courage. I mean, <laughs> he was very close to Liz Cheney. He and Liz Cheney did a million things together between about 2016 and 2020, sort of hoping to be, a, but both, incidentally supported Trump in 2020, but hoping to be the, you know, some major voices in a non-Trump Republican party. Uh, 20, uh, Trump got, uh, November 3rd happened, uh, Trump lost, Trump fought, you know, denied losing, January 6th happened, Liz Cheney broke. I mean, and, and fully and fundamentally. Mike Gallagher had one little video on January 6th itself from the Capitol. Where he looks panicked. He looks like very panicked, yes. kind of. And then votes against impeachment the next week, 
and is horrible for the next two or three years. Does nothing courageous. Doesn't defend the January 6th committee. Doesn't defend Liz Cheney. I mean, really, so he really was particular, given that he's actually intelligent and impressive in so many ways, his non-courage was particularly telling, I think, even more than some of the others. Yes. The other point I just make is analytically, though, what does it say that McMorris Rogers and McHenry and Gallagher think what they think? They're not foolish. They think the party is, Trump could lose, obviously, but they think the party is going to be Trumpist for at least the next several years, right? They don't think it's, it's as if they have, to, otherwise they'd hang on to this one election, Trump could lose, obviously, and then they think it's, it's maybe there's hope, but they know that the future of the party is more with Mike Johnson and Mike Gates than with uh, people like them. Matt Gates, watch out! The, Matt, uh, whatever his name the is, people, yeah, the people are going to be coming for you and saying that you're you've lost a step. I, you're, I you're certainly have. I, I, you know, <laughs> I'm not running. I'm not running for president. <laughs> you're handling a daily newsletter. Um, Only with Andrew Egg are doing he's doing the bulk <laughs> of it. So, <laughs> so yeah. And Bill, I, I think it's just it's worth putting a finer point on one element of the Gallagher thing, which is. I am just so fucking sick and tired of people deciding to do the right thing on, you know, at the very last page of the book, you know, and then deciding to retire. Right. And we, we've seen this over and over again. We saw it in 2016. Every candidate that ran, except for Jeb, I, I didn't criticize Trump until their concession speech, basically. Right. Until the campaign was over. And then they finally started to say what they really believed. We're seeing this even now with Haley, right? like where she's really starting to go at them after it's all like it's after it's functionally over, right? Like maybe she has a chance. I don't, I don't want to get you sad over there, Bill, but, but it's functionally over and now she's finally attacking him. And you're seeing this in Congress a lot where like people decide to do the right thing, right. As they're about to resign. And it's like, if Mike Gallagher knew what was right on the Mayorkas vote and he's able to do it because he knew he was going to the door. He also knew it was right on the January 6th committee and on impeachment and on supporting Liz. And to me, it's almost like more offensive to like do that. I mean, I guess it's good that he kept my orchestra from getting impeached, but I don't know. Part of me is almost like you might as well have just impeached my orchestra and gone out like you, like you served Mike. Uh, but I don't know. AB, is that too cynical? So this is the problem is that, that, he got on camera, right, and did some live stream on January 6th yeah. saying that the president was the only person that could call this off and this is third world shit or whatever he said at the yeah. time, right? So days later, he doesn't vote to impeach him because people get to people like Mike Gallagher. He's so promising. He's their best specimen. And they say, don't, we need people like you. Remember this refrain? Yeah. We need normal people. And Closet so normal. if it's not you, it'll be someone crazy. And so you are our best hope. And so you must not upset MAGA and you must just cower. And then he does. And no, actually making your last stand on the impeachment of Alexander Mayorkas is really not brave at all and has nothing to do with shit um, in terms of what we're facing, right? With the threat of Trump. So it's not, it's like a joke, but I was describing him as the kind of person just a few years ago, we would have all really hoped, sure. you know, we would have in the leadership of the Congress or as president. And so, um, and so, yes, he's cowards get to run again, half cowards, you know, or somewhere in the middle where they're maligned and then they're threatened with primaries. And then if you're Liz, you have to leave. Right. This is the spectrum. Romney has to leave. And we just thank him for writing a book an entire year in advance where he shot on his Republican colleagues in the Senate and still walked the halls with him. That to me is a definition of bravery in this environment that we're um, in. Yeah. I, that, that concept that you mentioned about how people feel like I need to be there because someone else crazy will come in. I, I just, I wrote about this a ton for the book. It was about just like the, this, I call it the junior Messiah fallacy, right? Like if I'm not here, then I'll be replaced by a crazy white nationalist or conspiracist. And my, my problem with that theory was always like, does that not say something about the spot that you're in? Right. If your replacement is going to be so fucking insane, like maybe shouldn't that you be reflecting on on, you know, the situation you've put yourself in? I, I, I again, it was maybe logical if you have the view that Trump goes away. But then to follow that logic to its end, you had to help him go away. 
And they, they never did that. So anyway, all right, Joe Biden. Is everybody ready? Is everybody ready to do this? Bill Crystal began his newsletter this morning. And, you know, there are a lot of ways to go into it. You know, he could have opened his newsletter with a little meditation on Donald Trump's tweet about how 2024 is our final battle. And with you at my side, we'll demolish the deep state. He could have gone into his first newsletter and talked about how Donald Trump made fun of Nikki Haley's husband for uh, serving in the Horn of Africa. Uh, tons of possible things. Uh, you know, Harvard, Yale football rivalry could have written about anything. The world is your oyster. Instead, Bill Crystal made a, a kind of uh, half-hearted, three-quarters-hearted argument that, that Joe Biden might consider stepping aside. So let's let's do it. I think we have a family disagreement on this one, but let's hear let's hear you make the case, Bill. I thought it was reasonably fully hearted. I mean, fully I hearted? I don't heart. know. It felt a little. I don't have as big a heart as you do, Tim. So for me, you know, for your hard. point of view, it was, it was mildly a little bit too qualified. But uh, believe me, I'm outraged with all those other things. I'll write about them a million times. I hope over the next. Well, I hope. I mean, I expect over the next eight nine months. I tweeted about them. Uh, the, the Michael Haley thing, incidentally, particularly appalling. And there, I do think that could hurt Trump. And so, just take a second on that. You know, are there no veterans in the country who just find it appalling that Trump makes fun of the fact that Nikki Haley's husband is deployed in Africa as if he's doing nothing, he's having a good time, he's just avoiding being with his wife or something like that? And does that not move some veterans to say he just can't be president again? Again, one always hopes these things have a little bit of effect that's cumulative. But you know what? To defeat Trump, there has to be, people have to, Mostly they have to want to defeat Trump, I take that point, but they have to be okay with the alternative. And the polling is just not getting better for Joe Biden, and Americans think he's too old, and he looks somewhat frail, and it was not good. I don't care that much about what the special counsel wrote, but his own performance in those 14 minutes Thursday night was bad, in my opinion, and it's unlikely to get better. And why are we being fatalistic about this? He likes being president. Well, fine. I, everyone does. And if they get to that status and he's done a good job as president, which he really does deserve credit for, but we could do better. And I'm very convinced. Well, I'm, I'm very convinced that a younger candidate would do better against Trump. And I'm pretty convinced. And this is where the three quarters harder comes in. But I think that's just trying to be, re, you know, realistic. I don't want to be, uh, you know, uh, Panglossian about it, uh, that I think the process could still produce without too much messiness and too much damage, a much better candidate. Uh, and that, so I think it's important to be Trump. I don't think Biden at this point is the best bet to be Trump. So I think Biden should do the right thing for the country. And How aside. would that work? How would the process work? Talk so to Biden just that. steps aside. Then we have a whole bunch of primaries. You'd have write-in candidates where it's too late to get on the ballot. You can still get on the ballot for some of the last few states. It probably would become a kind of uh, slightly chaotic, you know, a lot of people would run or, or people would, write them in. If, even if they said they weren't running, they'd be draft Whitmer, draft Shapiro, draft Newsom. Some of them would run, actually, especially, especially if Biden. We're, we're, we're talking in this case about Biden stepping aside. Yeah, certainly Vice President Harris would run. Uh, you probably no one might get a majority. You might have a broker convention. I did point out that uh, we had broker conventions in 1932 and 1860, also in Chicago, where the Democratic Convention is, and that produced Roosevelt and Lincoln. So uh, maybe broker conventions aren't always so bad. I got an email right away at like 9.31. The newsletter goes out at 9.30, I think, from someone. Who said, what about the night? There's another convention in Chicago you're not mentioning, 1968. <laughs> that wasn't such a good democratic convention, which is a point I had thought of. Actually, I had a, actually a couple of sentences in about it, and Andrew and I discussed it, and thought of it being like too complicated now. But I was, this is an interesting case study. That was a total mess, right? LBJ gets out. Robert Kennedy tragically gets assassinated. McCarthy, uh, Humphrey, hum terrible convention. I still think Hubert Humphrey would, was actually a better candidate and probably ran better against Nixon, he almost won, than LBJ as the incumbent would have. Now, Biden's not LBJ. There's no Vietnam War. I don't mean to, to, to you know, I wouldn't overdo the analogy or anything. But I just think an incumbent, it's getting harder and harder to say that the judgment of Biden hasn't settled in or isn't settling. And Doug Sosnick, a Democratic, veteran Democratic strategist, had a very good piece in the Times yesterday, which really made... I mean, it's advice to Biden, but it's really not encouraging about just hard-headed look at what Biden's numbers are. And he is the incumbent. It's going to be somewhat about him. It can't totally be about Trump. Carvel and Axelrod were quoted in the Times article, pretty tough comments for people who have to really work in or, or associate with <laughs> Democratic operatives in a way that I don't quite have to, honestly. So I feel like, you know what, analytically, if I'm with Sosnick and Carvel and Axelrod, I'm okay. 
if people don't like that, I urged him to step aside. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he's maybe he's right that he's the best alternative. That's what he says. The one who can beat Trump. But fine, then he'll reject the argument. But I feel I feel bad not making the argument. So I figured why not start with that? I and then appreciate we get you. To, then we can get to beating up Donald Trump, you know? <laughs> OK, well, I have a half hearted, a three quarters hearted disagreement that I'll get to. But I'm deeply curious where AB stands because AB was really with you last year. Right. And the fact that in arguing that there should be a primary, are you are you still with Bill or are you are you digging into your heels for President Biden at this point? So I started writing about this in July of 2022 because the polling is two years old on the fact that Biden's age has disqualified him amongst a majority of the electorate, including from his own party. That's only gotten worse. And he dug in anyway. So I wrote that. I wrote that from July toward, to the end of 2022. I wrote it throughout 2023. And I, we were, Bill and I are expecting he would go on holidays at the end of 2022 after a great midterm, come out, say he wasn't going to, but he waited till April. And when he was waiting, I thought he was going to say no. I thought this is his way. He's dithering. It's Biden's way. But he knows, the man knows how old he is. He's been humbled by life so many times and by the twists of fate, he certainly is not gonna do this. And I'm to this day completely stunned that he that he decided to run again. Um, I have different theories about why and who pushed him and this type of thing that I'll leave aside. I'm not certain about the calendar kind of, and kind of conventions and like ways that you know, ways that this would go. What I would like to think, because now as of this morning, especially I'm very pro deep state, you know, um, I would like to think that some cabal, if he stepped aside today, could sort of just push some kind of juggernaut, you know, where it's like down to Harris and one other person, right? And they have like, that it's not 13 people, including Elizabeth Warren, like not a silly situation, but enough donor pressure. Should we put in the House of Cards like- music under this, under this <laughs> section, uh, Jason? Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? I I just think that that would be my hope, my fantasy. I don't know if it's possible. Um, But I do think at this point, it's, it's, it's all but clear uh, to, uh, it should be to Biden that, that he, um, that people just, the people who decide these elections are not partisans and they're not politically informed. And they are in a handful of swing states and there are only a few thousand of them. And they, are just looking at Joe Biden and saying, this is elder abuse and the man needs to go home. And so we to stop to, I mean, we have to stop denying that. Again, I don't know about the logistics, but I'm still with Bill on the fact that it's way too grave a risk for us to sit here on election night and say, oh, let Joe Biden, he shouldn't have done that to us. I mean, it's, it's at some point he and his wife made the wrong call and, um, it's, 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 I want to go back. I want to circle back to one thing. His accomplishments have nothing to do with this. In every column that I wrote about this, and everyone can go back to them, I talk about his accomplishments, which are extraordinary and unprecedented, unprecedented legislative record in the Congress in a time where there's no margin, no math, and a completely gridlocked, polarized political environment. But no one knows about these accomplishments and it's too late for them to, quote unquote, learn about them through cabinet secretaries traveling the country and blue ribbon cuttings and some TikTok videos. So this is the pro- this is the denial in the, in the Democratic Party. Oh, we haven't started spending the money. Oh, abortion. Oh, this. Oh, that. You know what? That's great. It's not working so far when people are, don't pay attention to the stuff and have written it off completely. And think it's not only impossible for him to win the election and carry on, that he can't serve a second term and then he needs to go maybe to a hospital bed. I mean, this is the the problem. (laughs) This is the problem is that it's not what we think of him. There was, you know, there's been plenty of polling that shows that his accomplishments have not broken through with the voters they need to have broken through with. And that's really disappointing. But that's the reality. Well, you pre-butted a big part of my little speech I was planning about his accomplishments. So we'll save we'll save the Biden accomplishment speech for another podcast. Um, my other objection is just practical, and like the reality is, it's not if it, it's if it's not him, it's Harris. Like that's just I don't agree. Th- that. Those are the options that. on the table at this point in February twelfth. Totally not. If he got out, yeah, to- if he got out tomorrow, they would be right in Canada. Do you think others wouldn't run? 
Do you think it would be Harris because she would beat everyone else or because everyone would be yeah, too intimidated because to run against I her? Think, I think that a lot of people would be too intimidated to run against her, and I think it would be very, very challenging to defeat the first black woman vice president with a candidate that that – it doesn't that isn't of a white man for sure that does not fit those democratic bills and and just as a practical matter bill i remember i think one time when you're sitting in this podcast having carville carville gave a very i think poignant point about the democratic primaries which is like the people that win the black church win every time he's like if you go back through history and the democratic primaries it's like whoever does the best with older black voters can win the black church. Well, that is the core of the democratic base. Uh, you would add on to that. I think suburban women. So you have to come up. So you have to come up with a candidate in this fantasy world. I love AB's deep state plan that we're going to like put a new you know person forward. But like you have to come up with a candidate that can beat a sitting black woman vice president in with black voters and with suburban women. And you're going to have to do it like maybe at a, on a convention floor. Ah, boy, I find that very, very hard to imagine. Well, you you might be right, obviously. And I, look, I'd make only two points. A, you know, the fact that she is a that Kamala Harris is a black woman doesn't mean that all blacks or all women will vote for her. Obviously, they didn't in twenty twenty. A B, in, well, I don't even agree with A B on a multi candidate race, including Elizabeth Warren. That doesn't terrify me. I believe we had that in twenty twenty. And who won the presidency? Joe Biden. He won it in part because he won the primary against a lot of other people. And so C, I'll make this point, I think she probably Vice President Harris probably wouldn't win the primary. If she did, she would be stronger as a result. And I've now come to the view, and I, this may just sound crazy to people, that a Vice President Harris who defeats Gretchen Whitmer and Gavin Newsom and two or three other people in a set of primaries, write-in votes, who gets the nomination on a, in a kind of open convention, picks a vice president who would balance the ticket sort of. I'm not sure that's not a stronger ticket than Biden-Harris. It, so... I mean, I'm not so terrified of, I'm actually less terrified of Kamala Harris at this point than worried about Biden trying to make the case to the American public that, 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 that Joe Biden should be president for five more years uh, and that he should do so with a vice president, Harris, who hasn't had no, has had no chance to prove herself really as vice president. Maybe she missed some chances. Maybe that's her fault. Maybe it's the Biden White House fault. If she actually won a primary, it'd be like George H. W. Bush. In 87, 88, the wimp, the, he's, you know, the mush, he's a very bad, he's a, he's, a, he's a lame vice president. He's never been a great candidate. But you know what? Once he beat people, he was a stronger candidate for the in the general election. So that's my wishful thinking. And, uh, you know, we are competing, honestly. <laughs> well, here is where we kind of agree. I think I do. I'm actually not so scared of Kamala, but I'm just not. I think that she obviously has obvious weaknesses that are some of which uh, that she's brought upon herself, some of which that are totally not her fault about the nature of the swing voter and the swing electorate and how they might feel about the first enough, woman president. Enough. But I'm not that scared of her. I, and I, it comes down to AB was being very dismissive of the, well, the Democrats' response to this is, well, abortion, well, our accomplishments, well, we haven't spent any money, well, people haven't really sunk in that what the reality of Trump too would look like. Isn't that all true? Isn't that all true, though, that, that yeah, in I mean, 2022 that, that system worked, you know, that range it, of issues worked, and that in 2024 – you know, the Biden White House is going to have an advertising juggernaut, is going to be able to highlight I'll, I'll the try weaknesses. To help. Uh, people like me will all be trying to help make those issues work, and they should work. I mean, I, I don't get me wrong. I'm for Biden against Trump, 100%. And um, But I am i don't think it's quite like 2022 for various obvious reasons I, uh, we can get into. Uh, mostly that Biden, full of the talk that 2022 is a vindication of Biden. You know who actually won big in 2022? Gretchen Whitmer. Josh Shapiro, a lot of people who are a generation younger than Joe Biden. So I'm kind of simple minded. Why not let them run in 2024? I feel like that would be stronger. Um, so that's, you know, and the, there's such anti incumbency. There's lots that's unfair about it. But again, I, I think Joe Biden was not on the ballot in 2022. Final point about 2022, just incidentally, it was a very good off year for the Democrats by the standard of off year elections. The Republicans won the national popular vote in 2022 by about one percent. It's not as if you know, people are a little over. If we replicate 2022, Trump will yeah. win the presidency. Well, but some of that. But the Democrats did well in the key states, in the electoral college states. The, the they did, yeah, states. exactly. The Republicans Whitmer, overperformed in California I, and New York. I couldn't agree more. Whitmer, Shapiro, Warnock, they were great. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Bill, pretty convincing. AB, I'll give you the last word. 
Yeah, I, I again, I, it's a question of what they're going to break through on um, in a non-midterm year. In a presidential year, when those voters I talked about who will be turning out, who can decide these elections and, and are not you know, informed about who Carrie Lake is as an election denier. Bill's right. More Republicans turned out in 2022 than Democrats. Most, A lot of them just voted for Democrats in the right places and spared right. us secretaries of states and governors in key states who were election deniers. Um, a lot of that, you know, motivated a lot of those motivated young people who came out on abortion in the right places um, really saved the day. But uh, I, we can't count on strategic turnout in the right places, stopping uh, the fact that Trump has new converts. And I know this is dark and you guys don't like to yeah. hear it, but like a lot of people are perfectly fine with Donald Trump. They think they saw him the first time, and they think like Marco Rubio, who just said on Sunday, "Where's my? I'm going to exactly hold a paper bag. I'm keeping a paper bag by my desk during this podcast this year." Rubio, Rubio says, "I know exactly what he's done and will do with the NATO alliance," which Rubio knows is not true, but the average voter doesn't know about the Insurrection, Insurrection Act, doesn't know what a kleptocracy will mean, doesn't understand what guardrails will now be gone. And so they do look back and think it was fine. We see that in polling, guys. They're, I think they're really jaw with like the first Trump term. And it's, I think people, the Democrats are really in denial about that. They just are. They think Trump is so radioactive with the general electorate. He's not. You know, what's, you know what's great about this podcast, Tim, is that Tim Brake brings on AB to moderate my insanity. You know? <laughs> She's very, she is such a wonderful, genuinely wonderful, thoughtful, judicious person. But I'm glad, AB, that you're like making tri- tri- Tim even more unhappy than yeah, I am. Yeah, lapping you. Lapping, Bill <laughs> Crystal. <It's> like, <laughs> go harder. <laughs> Guys, um, we didn't promise you happy talk on this podcast. I've, we promised we'd tell you what we really think. I will say this, and this is important. I've seen, I've seen the Reddit memes. Um, about the bulwark, uh, you know, where they've changed uh, the the art on the podcast to Biden is the Biden is old podcast, and uh, I've seen it, and we I, I hear the feedback, but I just have to say, this is the thing. This when I said at the top, this is a family argument. Like what is happening here is ev- everybody agrees on one thing: the threat is so great, the threat is so great. And so if there are frayed nerves among people on the same side, it's because I, I, we're trying to work through what the best answer is to deal with such a great threat. And that's going to be something that we're going to be doing all year. And um, I hope you'll be doing it with us. Bill Chris will be back next Monday. A.B. Stoddard will be back a lot. I don't know. After that last performance, though, we might need a week, <laughs> a week or two break. <laughs> we might bring A.B. back in March. We'll see. You can catch her on the dark side with JVL. All right. That's it for the first podcast. Uh, before we let you go, I wanted to talk to you briefly about what is to come in this space. Uh, for five years, Charlie did an amazing job providing this outlet for people who are either thrust out of their political tribe or trying to understand how the right lost its mind. My goal is to continue in that spirit. I recognize I don't have his dulcet voice and talk radio cadence, but I'm going to do my best. I'll be bringing along the other friendly voices in the Bulwark podcast cinematic universe you've come to know and love. Uh, I'm going to make my North Star meeting his standard for quality and consistency and maintaining a willingness to always say the things I believe are true, even if not everybody wants to hear it. I think you might have just heard some of that. And to that end, this podcast is also going to evolve a bit. I want to widen the aperture, include a broader range of voices, ideologically, demographically, bring in some more newsmaker interviews with politicians, take a few detours from the endless parade of Trump horribles with subject matter experts. I want to argue a little more. My Mimi would want that. Arguing something that keeps me sane and sharp. So we're going to be looking for opportunities to have people on to spar with. Maybe even Carrie Lake will be on this podcast. Who knows? Um, And speaking of arguing with Carrie, I want to also make sure this is fun and not a slog. So we might mix in some goofier stuff from time to time, but it will not be Broadway trivia. Sorry, Charlie. Uh, that broadening is means that we're going to be rejiggering the lineup a little bit. As you heard, we'll be having Bill Crystal on most Mondays. Um, as for the beloved Trump trials and Will Salatin Mondays, those gents will be by the pod as the news demands a little bit more sporadically. Uh, you can catch Will with Mona on Just Between Us from time to time as well. With all that said, here's the thing that's most important. I'm absolutely convicted that this election is existential, that everything is on the line. It's our unfortunate reality. We're going to be taking it head on. Sometimes that will mean tough love for those of us who share the same goal of protecting liberal democracy from the Trumpian threat. Sometimes it will be 
pure Trump schadenfreude right into your veins. So it's time for all of us together to sharpen the knives, steal ourselves for the storm of lunacy ahead. I hope you do it with me, and I look forward to doing it all over again. We'll see you tomorrow.